I'm Shari Armstrong with your Fox 4 digital update. Tonight, investigators tell us a local woman says she went to a repair shop to get her phone fixed and later discovered an employee took personal pictures from her phone, sending them to his. Charlotte County deputies say the suspect tried to cover up his tracks. Deputies say this man, 28-year-old Cody Austin Terry, worked at a company called iFix in Port Charlotte. That's off of Tamiami Trail, right near that neighborhood Walmart. Investigators say the victim dropped her phone off at iFix to get it looked at, and that's when investigators say Terry took the woman's phone, searched through her personal files, and sent himself an explicit video of the woman to his own phone through text. Deputies say Terry then deleted the text from the victim's phone, but she still saw evidence that something was sent from her phone. Charlotte County deputies verified that he sent the message with that video to himself, and Terry now sits in a Charlotte County prison on a $5,000 bond. He will be in court to start the new year. Collier County leaders are ready to restore vital parts of their shorelines. They just need to get a plan in place before they do so, they say. Last week, Collier board members talked about approving more than $187,000 to rebuild vital shorelines and burns in the area. Well, those burns help provide some important natural protections for homes and buildings along beaches. The money has been approved for a company to use, but a plan to get those burns in place is still being ironed out. Now, here's the big issue, though. This operation has a hard deadline of March, six months from now. That's when hurricane season starts for 2023. So those protections need to be in place by then. That's a requirement by FEMA. We're going to be following along with this story and keeping you updated, as well as the recovery effort all across Southwest Florida following Hurricane Ian. Every vital step in the process we are documenting for you on Fox4Now.com. And we want to share this with you, a very special moment for a Lehigh Acre student that's moving on to bigger stadiums and brighter lights. That student's name is Richard Young, and he's still a student in Lehigh, but with a wave of a pen, he's now also a member of the Alabama Crimson Tide. Young has been heavily talented as one of the top running back prospects in this year's graduating class. He put up more than 1,700 yards rushing and 20 touchdowns last year. Not too bad, right? Young says he's not focused on personal goals, but rather winning the national championship with the rest of the Crimson Tide. Andrew? And tonight we are looking at temperatures dropping into the mid 60s, mostly cloudy skies in the forecast. We're also tracking the potential for maybe a little bit of patchy fog out there. Most of that can be in Collier County uh, through the early portions of the morning hours. I think once the sun comes up, that burns right off and you're looking at some partly cloudy skies. Temperatures tomorrow, though, rising up uh, to 79 degrees in Fort Myers, a little bit warmer inland at 80 in Clewiston, Moorhaven, 81 there in Immokalee. How about Naples? 78 degrees as well as 77 in Arcadia. Arcadia. And through the day uh, tomorrow, we are expecting a partly cloudy skies in the forecast. But you get into the afternoon, there's going to be a little bit of a push of a final little push of some moisture starting to move on through. That's going to allow for some shower activity uh, starting into the evening hours, into the overnight, and could see some additional showers and storms early on Friday morning. But we will be tracking all eyes on a significant cold front moving in on through the day on Friday. And uh, that's going to be that push of much colder temperatures. Take a look at this through the day as we're going to be waking up temperatures into the morning hours on Friday in this mid to upper 70s. By the afternoon, we're already in the 60s and continue to fall from there down into the 30s uh, through the overnight hours into your Saturday and uh, continuing to watch uh, those cold temperatures all the way through uh, the Christmas weekend. Take a look at the uh, seven day forecast and uh, you are going to see those temperatures down to 39 degrees there Friday night into Saturday. Only high temperatures Temperature Saturday and Sunday in the 50s, though we will start to warm things back up early next week, back into the 60s on Monday, upper 60s by Tuesday, and then 70s on Wednesday. Seen peeking through the rubble from Ian on Fort Myers Beach, you'll find a message, a promise to come back stronger than before. It's been about four months, bro. Buddy. For Tony Lavalle in his restaurant, Yo Taco. So what do you think, guys? His first order back sure. since Ian destroyed his original money? building sounds familiar, but Lavalle says it does not look the same. We're in a food trailer now. It's a little bit different. We can't, we don't have, we didn't have much storage before. Now we have less storage. And it can feel like an exciting time on Fort Myers Beach, just even up the road from Yo Taco. Other improvements we can see. Margaritaville still moving forward with building their location, but it's also a bittersweet time for Fort Myers Beach because just right across the street, another business says they're not returning. Places like the cottage on Fort Myers Beach completely gone. 
and business owners like Anita Saracita, who owns the Pure Peddler and Local Color. So um, the likelihood of them coming back as we know it is um, slim to none. I asked the Fort Myers Beach Chamber of Commerce's president to help me understand what the beach's future could look like. They expect only half of businesses, like the 60 restaurants and more than 40 hotels here before Ian, are likely to return. Business owners like Saracita say high priority prices are the reason why. Fort Myers Beach is going to be traded at very high premium. I wanted to find out myself, what are other property values like here on Fort Myers Beach? So I took out the Zillow app and it says for this piece of property right behind me, that's less than half an acre, over $3.2 million. And Anita says it's just the reality of Fort Myers Beach. That may very well determine whether or not a Yo Taco is rebuilt. It may determine whether or not a local color and a pure peddler are rebuilt. The rebuilding question now moves forward on Fort Myers Beach on a day Yo Taco reopened. It's just good to see anybody back. And others say they're looking to the future to define what reopening means. Reporting from Fort Myers Beach, Colton Chavez, Fox 4. We submitted a remodel permit about three weeks ago, I think. A permit? We had, we had um, a few feet of water inside. To rebuild Beverly Milligan and Roland Wyman's Fort Myers Beach home. It's behind Beach Baptist Church, about the middle of a sterile island. Went online and made sure that I got all the paperwork together that they really needed, that they were looking for. A process they found to be fast and simple even when they needed to submit more paperwork a week ago for a permit. I don't know how long it'll take, but it, I, I don't think it'll take too long. Other homeowners can't say the same. Many didn't want to go on camera telling me that they're afraid of retaliation, but they also told me they're frustrated with the town between the permit delays and rejections. I mean, I imagine there's got to yeah. be hundreds or thousands. A number and other questions I tried to get answered from the town of Fort Myers Beach spokesperson, who told me the permit employees are swamped and they're short staffed. I went to the temporary city hall and reached out again, but was told my request would not be fulfilled today. You know, we've all got just so much on our plate that that uh, everything is taking more time than we yeah. hope. Hope for a permit and hope to rebuild on Fort Myers Beach. I believe when I submit those, then my per permit would be complete. Now, according to the town's website, the anticipated time frame to get a permit between processing and reviewing is about 15 business days. Again, we couldn't get our questions answered from the town, but we will keep pushing until we get those for you. Reporting on Fort Myers Beach, Caitlin Knapp, Fox 4. Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky finished the first night of his visit to Washington, D.C. with a speech in front of Congress. It's not the first time Zelensky spoke to the U.S. Congress since Russia invaded Ukraine back in February, but it is the first time he addressed them in person. The Congress of the United States is a big friend of Ukraine, Ukrainian people, really, of freedom. Zelensky's trip comes as Congress negotiates a budget deal which would include $45 billion in funding for Ukraine. The bill is expected to pass. Leaders from both parties said Wednesday that it was a privilege to hear the wartime leader speak. Continuing our support for Ukraine is morally right, but it's not only that, it's also a direct investment in cold, hard American interest. The Democrat-led January 6th committee is delaying the release of its final report. In a statement, committee leaders said the report will come Thursday. We already know the committee made several criminal referrals for former President Donald Trump and his role in the January 6th riots. A special counsel, Jack Smith, will ultimately decide if Trump is tried. Well, hundreds of Thursday flights were canceled by Wednesday afternoon as airlines braced for a winter storm that will bring a deep freeze for most of the country. The National Weather Service is calling this storm a once in a generation type event. The winter blast is coming right in the middle of a busy travel season. AAA says 112 million people are leaving home for the holidays. Sam Bankman Freed will face a U.S. judge. The man known as SBF faces multiple fraud charges after the collapse of the crypto exchange he founded, FTX. The exchange was once worth billions, but is currently in bankruptcy and will not let people withdraw money. SBF was being held in a jail in the Bahamas, where FTX is headquartered. The island's attorney general said SBF will be extradited Wednesday night.
Tucked away in Tucson, Arizona, migrants seeking guidance find a warm welcome. Start expecting people coming at any hour during the day. The number of migrants arriving varies by day, and they come from around the world. It's 10 a.m. about how many people have been dropped off. Um, I think we've had at least one bus of people coming in so far. Many we spoke with here come from Cuba and Peru. We'll have the water for them after the testing and some food. Diego Piña Lopez is the Casalitas Associate Director. The nonprofit works with migrants. It's absolutely free. Everybody can get one of anything. Lopez says they've seen a growing demand since the pandemic, adding that over the last few months they've beefed up staff and outreach as they brace for an influx in migrants seeking assistance. Toothpaste, toothbrush comb, uh, deodorant and soap and everybody at least gets a chance to sort of freshen up with these. Preparations for the expiration of Title 42, which was temporarily paused by the U.S. Supreme Court less than 72 hours before it was set to be lifted. The Trump era health policy has been used to expel more than 2.5 million migrants since it went into effect in March of 2020. Now it's very, very few of those people that really need to come for asylum having that opportunity to come. He says the latest ruling by the high court only added to the confusion, leaving nonprofits ready to help in limbo. Another jerk in a direction of everyone was expecting Title 42 to go away. He says migrants who heard the pandemic era policy was set to expire likely started their journey to the U.S. and may now be forced to wait in Mexico, putting them in danger. Kidnapping, no shelter, nowhere to eat, no food no clothes, clean clothes, the, uh, and far, far worse situations that come through. Some migrants here met the exception of Title 42. Make sure that they're provided food, clothing, a shelter, a safe space, a place to laugh, space to cry, and to, to just feel human and have a choice again. While some nonprofits say they're ready, state government officials disagree. Arizona Attorney General Mark Bronovich and Arizona Democratic Senator Mark Kelly oppose lifting Title 42. Kelly says they need a proper plan in place. In the meantime, this nonprofit says they'll continue working to keep migrants informed and help them reach their destinations. About 90 some percent of our families go by flight. Many go by bus as well. As respiratory viruses rise among children, the CDC is investigating a spike in another pediatric illness, invasive group A strep infections. At least two children died after contracting invasive group A strep. Group A strep typically causes mild infections like strep throat or scarlet fever. In fact, doctors say about 10 to 20 percent of school-aged children are colonized with it, meaning the bacteria lives on the body without causing infection. And so what we're seeing now over the past little bit here in Colorado, at least, um, is an increase in the number of what we call invasive uh, group A strep infections. And by invasive, we mean that the group A strep bacteria gets into part of the body where uh, it normally isn't. Dr. Sam Dominguez says group A strep can sometimes lead to more severe disease, like pneumonia or bone infections. It's also been known to cause bacterial sepsis and even toxic shock. Typically, we see maybe one or two cases a month at the most. Um, and we first here in Colorado started seeing an increase in cases about mid-November. Uh, and we got a little concerned because we were starting to see maybe one or two and even up to three cases a week, uh, which is very unusual in terms of the overall numbers. As for what's driving the spike, he believes there could be a new strain of the bacteria, or it could be related to the recent surge in respiratory viruses. But he stresses that invasive group A strep is rare. Parents should look for symptoms like difficulty breathing, loss of appetite, trouble sleeping, or rash. Erin Heinbrock was holiday shopping using just her Apple Watch to pay. So you just double tap on your watch. She's one of millions of Americans who now shop with mobile wallets, and she loves it. My card comes up, and it's super easy. I don't have to fuss with getting a credit card out or cash or anything. Michaela Vanderwally and Kelly Carson, who own a craft boutique, say the technology makes transactions much easier. Not having to mess with change, not having to carry the change <laughs> around all day. Nathan Grant with Money Tip says he understands why some people might hesitate to use a mobile wallet. I think the fear comes from, well, I don't want to save my info on my phone. 
But he says adding a debit or credit card to your mobile wallet actually adds a layer of protection for you. That's because the number is then encrypted, so you're not using your actual credit card number to make the transaction. So what it does is it allows the payments to be processed without exposing your actual information. If you lose your phone or smartwatch, Nathan says, your wallet more than likely stays safe. You're gonna need either like a passcode, fingerprint scan, maybe a face scan if you have Apple products. The major mobile wallets are Apple Pay, Google Pay, and Samsung Pay, with apps already integrated in your mobile device. On top of security, mobile wallets can help free up space in your actual wallet and store other information, like airline tickets and hotel reservations. One last reminder, though, Nathan says keep a card or some cash handy. Most retailers, big and small, now accept phone-based payments, but a local neighborhood shop may not. Aaron Heinbrock loves the flexibility. It's a lot easier. I use it all the time. And that way you don't waste your money. I'm John Matteris. Sales dropped again in November. It's the 10th straight month of decline and represents one of the weakest months for home sales in the last 15 years. Analysts say higher interest rates have pushed a lot of would be home buyers out of the market. The average rate on a 30 year fixed is around 6.5%, compared to 3.1% last year. Markets rallied Wednesday. The Dow Jones and the NASDAQ were both up about 1.5% after reports that consumer confidence rebounded in December. Investors also saw bright spots in two of America's biggest companies. Nike and FedEx both beat their earnings projections for the quarter. Chevy is recalling about 140,000 of its Bolt electric vehicles due to a fire risk. GM, which owns Chevy, said in a statement that a part of the seatbelt can ignite the car's carpets after a crash. The company says this is rare, but it might have happened three times already. You can check your VIN number on Chevrolet.com to see if the recall affects you. I'm meteorologist Andrew Shipley, and uh, we saw some clouds around today. They broke up a little bit into the evening, but we are expecting to cloud back up here overnight. Uh, looking at 64 degrees, a little bit of patchy fog also uh, possible there. This will be brief, though, as we get in towards the overnight hours. See about 4 o'clock, start to form up there. Uh, probably peaks right around 7 o'clock as the sun rises, and then we'll start to break up from there. Uh, but uh, we are overall looking at partly sunny skies out there tomorrow. Temperatures climbing up. It's about 79 degrees in uh, Fort Myers, 77 there. Punta Gorda at 78 down in Naples. There is a chance, though, for maybe a few isolated showers and thunderstorms as we get towards about 1 o'clock into the afternoon, and then they should push on out of here. But another warm day, a last of a couple warm days up for you. Friday, the big front moves through, and that's what's going to cool those temperatures down. Look at that. Saturday, uh, a high of 53 degrees with those overnight temperatures down into the 30s. We'll be seeing that uh, cool couple days there and then warming back up as we head in towards next week. When we use the dishwasher, we think about how it's cleaning our dishes, but there's a technology growing across the U.S. that takes the hot water from the dishwasher and reuses that energy to heat buildings. Many of us have heard of wind and solar energy, but wastewater can also be a significant source of renewable energy. Thermally heating and cooling buildings is about 50% of energy consumption in any city, and so doing it more energy efficient and more sustainable is very important to the environment. Leslie Fangman works for Centrio, the largest operator of district energy in the U.S. She gave us a tour to show us the pipes and machines taking wastewater from the Denver metro area to thermally heat and cool commercial buildings. Most sanitary sewer lines um, run very hot, upwards of over 70 degrees Fahrenheit, even in the wintertime. And a lot of that is driven because your dishwashers, your washing machines, your hot showers, all of that water that's heated goes down into the sanitary sewer pipes. The heart of the operation is this Shark Wastewater Energy Transfer System. Leslie calls it a heavy duty garbage disposal. The sewage water comes up into this macerator, the heavy solids fall down to the bottom, and then the sludge comes up through these pipes, and this is the heat exchanger where it transfers the heat of the sewage 
to the clean water. The sewage water and the water being transported to buildings never touch. Leslie says it's a closed loop. This system, when it's fully built out, will save the equivalent of 6.6 passenger miles of CO2 out of the air annually. And she says the water that's conserved is equivalent to five Olympic swimming pools. So we get the benefit of basically utilizing energy from the sewer that would have just been wasted or not used at all, and then keep not only greenhouse gases, but also water conservation um, for the system. While this technology is quite new to the U.S., Leslie says it's been used in Western Europe for more than a decade, in Canada for the past five years. This facility in Denver will serve as a model for systems that can be created in metro areas all over the country. We're excited to be the first one, but not the last. <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Ruiz reporting. America has a traffic death problem, and safety advocates say our infrastructure, our sidewalks, and our streets are setting us up for failure. Well, the federal government is putting money behind this issue, but those advocates say more urgency is necessary. The shame that comes from drivers when you're ripping through, and not only are you facing an environment that's hostile and harmful and unsafe and life-threatening and impossible for a lot of people, but then you're shamed and honked at. Jonathan Stahls invited me on a walk the other day. Aside from the company, whew, nothing about it was pleasant. We walked to a couple of bus stops along a major arterial route in his city of Denver. You see that the sidewalk or sidewalk just ends right into the dirt. Bus stops where you had to trudge on messy dirt covered paths on the footprints. side of the busy road to get to. Footprints and tire tracks and dirt and snow show that many people call this their commute. They're, they're moving so fast. And you have engineering that has long, long been centering high speed car traffic as the priority. Jonathan became an advocate for safer streets after he walked across the entire country. He now documents infrastructure flaws on social media under the name pedestrian dignity. Flaws, he says, are a symptom of generations of prioritizing car travel. Get the basic dignity on the table for pedestrian modality, our most inherent form of getting around. The Governor's Highway Safety Association says pedestrian traffic deaths have been rising steadily since 2010, increasing faster than all other kinds of traffic deaths, last year being a record breaker. It predicts that 7,485 pedestrians were killed last year, an 11.5% increase from 2020. City streets were designed primarily to move cars, to move as many cars as fast as possible. Jill Locantori is the executive director of Denver Street Partnerships. She works to connect lawmakers with changemakers to make sure the pedestrian perspective is heard. She says the conversations her group is having are happening in cities nationwide. Pedestrians and bicyclists are the most vulnerable and the most likely to be hit and killed in a crash, but our streets are unsafe for everybody. It seems the federal government is listening at the end of October, the U.S. Department of Transportation released a set of guidelines on how to create safer streets for pedestrians, hoping cities will use some of the $9 billion allocated from the infrastructure bill to improving streets with pedestrians and cyclists in mind. While the money is there, it is up to local and state governments to decide on how to spend it. This is not a pipe dream. We know how to prevent traffic fatalities. It's just a matter of having the political will to do that. These are different traffic crashes that where people, loved ones, didn't survive this intersection. Jonathan hopes those in power act with urgency and do so with empathy for pedestrians. There's, there's just such a loud ache to, to, be, to be in a place of empathy and openness for what, it, what it's actually like to get around practically to everyday places. I'm Vanessa Mashani reporting.